Well, good morning. Good morning. This week we're beginning a journey with Joseph, and I'm sure that, that many of you are familiar with Joseph, the, the son of who? Somebody help me out? Jacob. All right, who was his grandfather? Isaac. And his great-granddaddy? Abraham. All right, so Joseph comes from a very, very significant family. And we are going to begin this morning by looking at Genesis chapter 37. So we'll be there in just a few moments. But as we begin to prepare our thoughts for what God wants to speak to us through his word this morning, I just want us to kind of kind of think about that subject of, of family. Because there's something that you and I each have in common when it comes to our families. And that's that you did not choose your family, right? How many of you, I didn't, you didn't choose what home you'd be born into, right? None of us chose that. We just, we were placed there. For you that haven't uh, had a chance to meet my family, this is my family, my wife, Laura, and that's my son, Evan and, and Lena. But I can promise you that, that Evan and Lena did not get to choose who their dad was, all right? And if they would have chosen, maybe they would have chosen better. I don't know, all right? I'm a little crazy sometimes. But here's the thing, as we are going to move into Genesis 37, as we think about Joseph and his family, I have a feeling that, that maybe there were moments in Joseph's life where he would not have chose his family. The family that he was born into is very unique. Now, let's begin by, by considering the fact that, that Joseph, as we're going to pick up in Genesis 37, he's 17 years old, and he's grown up in a home of considerable wealth and means. He's been loved and taught by his dad and his mom. He's been raised with, with, with the, the knowledge of God, and, and, and some things are going on in his life that are good. He's, he's strong. He's healthy. He's 17 years old. He's good looking, right? And so you might be thinking, man, Joseph is really, really living the life. But there's some other things that we're going to find out about Joseph's family that make his situation pretty unique. All right. His family had not just one mom, not just two moms, not just three moms, but four moms. All right. And that causes a lot of turmoil in the home. Add to that, that that Joseph's mom passes away, giving birth to his youngest brother. And so there was a lot going on. But then his ten older brothers are a pretty unruly bunch. Ten, ten older brothers uh, have, by the time we come to Genesis 37, we're going to find out that they have committed some, some sins that are quite great. And they are a wild and unruly bunch. All right, they have committed murder. There has been all kinds of things going on. Uh, the oldest has had an affair with one of his father's wives. All right. So how many of you would say, I'm feeling a little bit better about my family? All right. All right. So we're going we're gonna to enter a story that's, that's pretty wild. And we're going to go on a journey with Joseph that takes all kinds of twists and turns. And as we take this journey with Joseph, I, I want us to, to see the unseen hand of God. And I want us to not just learn Joseph's story, but I want us to learn what we can apply to our lives through learning Joseph's story and understanding it, not just in its historical context, but also through the lenses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's our journey this morning. Joseph grows up in a home full of turmoil. And despite the unruly behavior of his older brothers, though, we find Joseph is a young man of high morals and of great integrity. So let's enter this sort of dysfunctional family in Genesis chapter 37. And we're just going to work through some, some of the verses together. So Genesis chapter 37, and let's begin in verse 1. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So let's just sort of, sort of stop there for a moment. Bilhah and Zilpha were the two not quite wives uh, of Jacob, all right? And if many of you remember his story, his, his original two wives were... Uh, each offered him another wife to have more children with because there's this competition going on right between Rachel and Leah. And so these children are sort of the, the outsiders. All right. But Joseph grows up with them. They're, they're close to his age. 
And it says that he brought a bad report to his father. All right, Joseph was a good kid, right? He was the kid to get in trouble, right? He was the kid that, that, at least on the outside, did what his father asked and expected, right? And that just made his brothers, who were a pretty wild and rough bunch, look all the worse. And, and how many of you maybe have had an experience like that? Anybody, right? You know, those goody two-shoes sometimes just make the rest of us look, look bad. I, I grew up uh, just, I'm 18 months younger than my older sister, who was a camper here many, many years ago. And she's been a faculty member here. She teaches viola. And my sister was not perfect, but she sort of knew how to look perfect. Does that make sense? And so we were one year apart from in school. And so sometimes I'd have the same teacher. And they would, at the beginning of the year, they'd say, Oh, you're Amy Davis's brother. And at the end of the year, they'd say, Oh, you're Amy's brother. Are you with me? You'll figure it out. So he brings a report back to his father. How many of you have ever, ever been told on? Got a younger sibling? They've ever tattled on you? How does it make you feel? Not too good, does it? So, so Joseph brought a bad report. So Joseph, uh, I don't necessarily know that he's just trying to be a tattletale, but he's an honest son who tells the truth. And then it says, now Israel, and that's, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age and also the son of his favorite wife. All right, there, there's a lot of issues going on in Joseph's family. And, and we're going to see that these issues are all going to contribute to a very significant event that's going to, about to happen. There's, there's a building towards something. So we see right now that Joseph is kind of the good, goody two-shoes son of the family. He is a bit of a tattletale. And he is dad's favorite. Now, that's not his fault. All right? Are you with me? All right? That's not his fault. But he's dad's favorite. And it says his dad loved him more than any of his other sons. And it says that he made him a robe of many colors. All right? You all remember Joseph's special clothes. So Joseph has special clothes. Right? He has the best, the designer, the latest. Right? While his brothers are wearing hand-me-downs and things from Walmart. It says, but when his brothers saw, verse 4, that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And so you're starting to begin to feel the tension in this home, right? Can you feel that tension that's going on? His brothers cannot even speak peacefully. They can't find one nice thing to even say about their brother, right? Because they're jealous of him. He's dad's favorite. And he makes them look bad. But things are about to get even worse because look at verse 5. It says, Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Check out his dream. Any of you guys ever have any crazy dreams? All right. I had several last night. All right. So many, so many times I woke up and just thought, hmm, it is good to be awake. But this isn't just one of those random dreams that we get and wake up just so, you know, he's just so relieved. This is a dream from God. And he shares it with his brothers. And he says, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, how do you think this is going to go over? All right. Younger brother, goody two shoes, right? Tattletale. And now he says, hey, let me tell you about my dream. You know, we were binding up our sheaves of wheat. And, you know, your sheaves all gathered around mine. And then they bowed down to me, to my sheaf. His brother said to him in verse 8, Are you indeed going to reign over us? Are you going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. But then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his fathers rebuked him. And said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his, fathers kept these, his father kept the saying in his mind. 
And so we have this scene set for us. Joseph now has these dreams that God has given him about his brothers and even his family bowing before him. And, and this is all building to some incredible tension, right? There, the tension in the home it is overwhelming. I mean, it is an overwhelming tension in the home. The hatred towards Joseph is so palpable. And then what's going to get even crazy is Jacob is going to make what possibly what is one of the most horrible parenting decisions that has ever been made. All right. You know, I can promise you as a parent, there's been times where I've made bad parenting decisions. All right. And maybe you're here. You don't have to raise your hand. Let me say, you know, my parents have made some bad decisions. Right. Just like, why would you do that, mom? That not a good idea. Well, let's look at, at, at Jacob's parenting idea. It says in verse 12, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, that's Jacob, said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, Here I am. So he said to them, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me a word. Right. So, so, I mean, Jacob has to know a little. I mean, he knows that there are, is tension in the home. He knows that his sons hate their brother. Right? But he says, he says, Joseph, I'm going to send you out because his brothers were out in a potentially dangerous place. All right? They were out because of some past history with the family and the people from where they were from. There was reason for Jacob to be concerned about the safety of his sons. And so he sends Joseph to go find out how they're doing and bring a report back to dad. Maybe not the best idea. All right, but he does it. And Joseph is obedient and faithful, and he honors his father. And, and as we follow the text, it says that he went. And so he went, and he came to the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, and he found a man wandering in the fields. This is verse 15. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And so Joseph went up after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So Joseph travels a long way, and when he gets to where he's going, his brothers aren't there, but he continued, you know, he was a faithful son. He was doing what his dad asked him to do. And he went the extra mile, if you will, many extra miles, because he had traveled, didn't find them, and then he pursued them on to where he'd heard a report they were. And then it says in verse 18 that he finds his brothers. And in verse 18 it says, They saw him from afar. And before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. And so you can see his brothers have said, This is our moment. This, here comes Joseph, the dreamer. Right? This is our moment. Look at verse 19. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we will see what becomes of his dreams. And you thought you had sibling problems. And so his brother's like, we're going to kill him. And we'll pretend that something killed him. That'll be our story. But when Reuben heard it, verse 21, he rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him in this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to their father. Now, we don't know all that's going on in Reuben's heart. He's the oldest. He is not necessarily the godliest of guys. But there's something in Reuben's heart and his mind that says, I just can't do this to dad. I can't, I can't, I can't watch my dad. I know the grief that dad will have. And I've caused my dad enough, enough grief already. But he is afraid of his brothers, I believe, and so he does not just tell them, no, we're not going to kill him. So he says, let's throw him in a pit, and, uh, and th we'll just do that. So they do that, and look at what happens. It says, so Joseph came to his brothers. They stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. You're real nice brothers, right? They strip their brother, throw him in a dry pit, and they sit down and have lunch. Picnic time. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, the camels, with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, and on their way down to, to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Now, at this point in the story, it's obvious that Reuben is not there. So we don't know if like, they sent Reuben back into town to get ice cream or, or what's going on. But Reuben's not there. 
And they see these traitors come by, and Judah, one of the brothers, says, man, you know what, if we killed our brother, we're not going to gain anything by that, and he might even feel guilty. You know, he is our brother. Let's just sell him. <laughs> nice, nice brother. Let's just sell him. So they do. They yank him up out of the pit, and they sell him. The Midianite traders passed by. They drew Joseph up. They lifted him out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And then they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit, he saw Joseph was not in the pit. He tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? What, what am I going to do? I, I just want us to stop here for a couple of moments and just think about, think about what's going on in Joseph's life. Right, because up until this point, he has lived in a dysfunctional family. Right? There's a lot of turmoil and there's a lot of issues. But, but Joseph's life has been pretty good. Right? He, he is favored by his father. He has the nice clothes. Right? He, he has the respect of his dad and a good relationship. And so I was actually able to help us get a little bit more insight into what was going on with Joseph. I was actually able to find the archive of his Twitter account. All right? You're not going to believe this, but I, that's the amazing thing about the internet. So I actually found some of the hashtags that um, Joseph used for his life before this day. So here's some of them. Blessed, all right? <coughs> favored, all right? So he'd post things, favored. God is good, right? Check this one out. Love my cloak, all right? <laughs> and the last one I found was this, dreams. Joseph's life was good. I mean, it was not easy, but good. But in a day, in a day, everything changed. In a day, everything changed for this 17-year-old young man. And in Genesis 42, we find out that while his brothers were having lunch and he was in the pit, he was begging them for his life and for his freedom. Can you imagine what it was like to be Joseph? In a day, everything changed. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you can identify this morning. Maybe you can identify because maybe for you, you've experienced the reality that in a day, in a moment, life can change. Whether it's an accident, a, a report from a doctor, news that you didn't want to hear, a rejection. You found out that your parents are getting a divorce. I don't know what it might be. It could be many things but life can change in a moment. And Joseph's life has changed, and not for the good. And we might pause right here. And if we didn't know the rest of the story, and, and I just want us to kind of for a moment pretend that maybe we don't know the rest of the story, we, we might be really, really tempted to ask this question. Where was God? I mean, where was God when all of this was happening? I mean, Jacob had prayed that morning for his son. He prayed, God, keep Joseph safe. God, keep your hand on him. Protect him. Where was God? Joseph was just doing what his father asked him to do. He was obeying. He was doing the right thing. Why did God let this happen? Have you ever wrestled with that question? Why? God, why? Why? It's not fair. It's not right. It shouldn't have happened. This shouldn't have happened. Maybe you can identify with that this morning. Let's just finish up the chapter very quickly. It gets even more twisted. It says, after they sold him, they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat and they dipped the robe in blood. They sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father. And they said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's they noticed they didn't say our brothers, your son, your son's robe or not. And he identified it and he said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his son for many days. And all of his sons and his, all of his daughters rose up to comfort him. Isn't that pretty twisted? Right? His sons deceive their father into thinking that Joseph is dead. Right? And then they come around and give him hugs and say, oh, Dad, it's okay, it's okay, it's going to be okay. And, you know, we just step back and we think, God, why don't you just sort of vaporize these guys, right? 
Have you ever just wanted God to instantly serve justice to somebody that you thought deserved it? Anybody? All right. We all tend to want instant justice for others, but we never want instant justice for ourselves, do we? Right? We're, when it comes to ourselves, we're sort of glad that God doesn't instantly bring his justice. But nothing, nothing seems to happen. And we might wrestle, God, why? God, where are you? What are you doing? What are you up to? What do you do when you don't understand life and God seems distant and God seems to have not answered your prayers and God doesn't seem to be doing anything? What do we do? Well, look at the last verse of this chapter because there's some foreshadowing and a clue. It says in verse 36, Meanwhile, meanwhile the Midianites had sold him in Egypt, to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. And then the story is going to break off for a little bit, and we'll pick it up tomorrow. But I want us to focus in just on that one word, meanwhile. Meanwhile. Because it's a bit of foreshadowing, and it's a reminder that God was at work. And God was in the circumstances of Joseph's life. His unseen hand was absolutely at play. And even though it didn't look good, and even though it wasn't good, God was in control. He was at work, and he was sovereignly directing the affairs of Joseph. Meanwhile, meanwhile, while all these injustices were taking place, while his brothers were telling great lies, while his dad was suffering grief, meanwhile, while Joseph was scared, while Joseph was terrified of what was going to happen, while he was taken to a foreign country and sold as a slave, meanwhile, meanwhile, God was at work. Many times life will bring circumstances that don't seem good, that aren't good. And maybe you can identify right now, but what I want you to know is that when we wrestle with those questions, God, where are you at? Why aren't you answering my prayer? God, why aren't you doing something? God, why? And it's okay to have those questions, and it's okay to wrestle, and it's okay to wonder, but I want you to know what you can do when you feel that way. That you can know that although you don't understand and that you don't see, God is in control. He is on His throne, and meanwhile is taking place in your life. I love the story of this lady. Her name's Corey Ten Boom. Many of you have heard her story. Maybe you've read her books. She grew up in Holland, and her family hid Jews during the Holocaust. And they were caught, captured and caught, and she and her sister, Betsy, were taken to prison. And prison was rough. Prison was not good. But then things got even worse because they were moved from prison to a concentration camp named Ravensbrück. And there, they experienced some horrific things. They were moved into a dorm, and, and, and Corey was just very, very overwhelmed. It smelled, it was cramped, it was horrible. And then as they laid down in the rotting straw, something bitter. And she jumped up, and she said, there are fleas. And she said, she said Betsy, what are we going to do? Betsy, what are we going to do? And she heard her sister saying, show us, show us. And she was like, what? And then she realized her sister was praying. And then she said, she said, Corey, remember what we read this morning? Remember the scripture we read this morning? God has already shown us what to do. And she said, Betsy, what did we read this morning? They had read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. And it says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And Betsy stopped. Or Corey stopped. And Betsy said, keep reading. And the next verse says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And Betsy said, that's it. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give thanks. 
And Cora's like, what do we have to be thankful for? And she said, well, we can be thankful that we're together, that we weren't separated like so many families. And she was like, oh, yes, you're right. And then she said, we, we can be thankful that, that you have your Bible. She wasn't searched like so many of the other prisoners were. And so they had a copy of God's Word. Oh, yes, we can be thankful that Jesus, we can be thankful that it's so crowded in here because many, many women will be able to hear about the God who loves them. And so they thank God for the crowded conditions and some other things. And then, and then Betsy says, and now we need to thank God for the fleas. And that's where Betsy just lost. Or Betsy said, we need to thank God for the fleas. And Cora was like, no way, you know, for the fleas. And she says, yes, this is God's will for us right now. And she thanked them for the fleas. But Cora didn't understand it. Not till many, many, many months later did she realize after overhearing a conversation that Betsy had overheard, because they were never molested, they were never treated the way some people were. In fact, they held Bible studies and worship services in the barracks. In fact, their service got so crowded, they had to go to two services. Isn't that amazing? And they could never figure out why they were not stopped until one day overheard a conversation about some people who were supposed to come into their barracks and they said, no way, we're not going in there. We're terrified of the fleas. <laughs> terrified of the fleas. Terrified of the fleas. I read this quote a few weeks ago. It says, we can best help others with their fears and distress when we have been through our own and found God faithful. And that's true, yes, of us. We can go through things and then help others. But I also want you to know that it's also true because Jesus, your Savior, is also your high priest. And he is someone who experienced life as a human. God became man in Jesus. And Jesus experienced life. And he experienced, like Joseph, what it was like to be betrayed and sold out. And Jesus experienced what it was like to be beaten and mocked and slapped and spit on. He experienced what it was like to be abandoned. And so I want you to know this morning that God might not always immediately change your circumstances. And he might allow things to happen that you won't understand and you can't figure out. But I want you to know that meanwhile is taking place in your life. God is on his throne. He has a purpose and a plan. And we're going to continue to see that unfold this week. But I want you to know that, that meanwhile, while you're waiting, you can trust God. Because he, not only is he with you, but he knows your heart and he knows your hurt. And so you can trust him. God was on the throne when Joseph was sold by his brothers. And God was on the throne when Jesus died on the cross. And God is on the throne today. And we can trust him. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul says, and listen, Paul, Paul knew about the re harsh realities of life. He said, rejoice always, pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Three very practical things that we can do when we don't know what to do. Three very practical things that we can do when we don't know why God is allowing what he's doing. Three very practical things that we can do when we're wrestling with that question. God, where are you? Number one, we worship. We worship. He says rejoice always. And our joy is found in God, right? Joy is not something we seek in the world. Joy is something we find in God. And so we worship even when we don't understand what God is doing. We worship in the valley. Here's the thing. If you only worship God in the good moments of life, you're not really worshiping God. You're only worshiping what he does for you. It's in the valley that we learn worship. It's in the valley that we learn to place our faith in God and to praise Him and to worship Him. Number two, we pray. And God may not answer how you want or when you want, but He hears and He will answer in His time. So we pray. Pray continually, Paul said. And number three, give thanks. Give thanks like Corey and Betsy did. Give thanks because it's God's will for you. Give thanks because meanwhile is happening in your life. I love this quote and we'll close with it. Corey Ten Boom said this. She says, when we are powerless to do a thing, it is a great joy that we can come and step inside the ability of Jesus. Listen, life will sometimes be too great for you to handle. Often it will be. But you don't have to handle it alone because Jesus is willing to walk through it with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we've had this morning to, to open your word. And Father, I thank you for the story of Joseph. 
Father, I thank you that, that you recorded this narrative for us so that we might know of your work in history, we might know of your work in this family, but also that we might know of your work in our lives as well. And Father, I just pray for each person here this morning, each student, each counselor, each faculty member. Father, I don't pretend to know their heart or what's going on, but Father, if they're in a place right now where they don't understand and they're wrestling with that question, why? Father, I pray that you would open their eyes, that they might see you for who you are. They might see your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, I pray that they might trust that you're a God who is at work and that meanwhile is taking place. And Father, I pray that you would help all of us when we find ourselves in those places to trust you. Father, may we learn to worship in the valley. May we pray and trust you continually. And Father, may we give thanks. And God, may you lead us through the valley safely. Father, help us to trust you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.